We want to take this time to thank you so much for taking your time to have followed us patiently through the study that we did on Ellen White. And uh, we also would like to uh, ask you to close your eyes with us as we pray, as we begin our study for today. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for your love and your grace. We ask for your Holy Spirit to be with us, to guide us, to strengthen us as we study your Bible. Strengthen us by your mighty hand, and may you lead us in the path of righteousness. Help us to understand your word. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Um, our, my study today will be dealing mainly with Ellen White's message and science. Ellen White's message and science. There have been a lot of allegations made about Ellen White's health message that is not scientific. There is no scientific basis for it. And uh, today we want to analyze what is Ellen White's health message and how does that affect you and me? So I would like to begin with a text that uh, we've been reading. We're making it uh, our own memory text now. It's found in Second Chroni Corinthians, rather Second Chronicles. Second Chronicles chapter 20 verse 20. Second Chronicles chapter 20 verse 20. The Bible gives us a truth that we need to take it, especially the generation that is living in the time that we are living. Second Corinthians chapter 20 verse 20. And they rose early in the morning and went forth into the wilderness of Tokoa. As they went forth, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, O Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God, so shall he be established. Believe his prophet, so shall he prosper. The counsel here is for us to believe the Lord our God, so shall we be established. Believe his prophet, so shall we prosper. And uh, that is true also of the health message. Uh, God has given us a message because he knew about coronavirus. He knew about many things that are going to come upon this earth that will be taking the attention of many people to try and um, lead them in the path uh, of death, degradation. And God foresaw the current condition of the world, even with coronavirus, lifestyle disease, that's killing so many people. And he gave us a message that would prevent us from getting infected by this lifestyle chronic diseases and significantly reduce our chances of getting infectious diseases. And uh, when we look at this health message, it's so amazing if you look at the historical background of how God prepared us to be able to understand this message. After 1844, as we did um, Ellen White's role in Adventist doctrines, we are well aware that Ellen White uh, basically helped to develop the doctrines of the Seventh-day Adventist Church um, the 18, from 1847, 1848 to 1850 during the Sabbath conferences, Ellen White was instrumental in doing that. So the other thing that's very important is that um, we want to look at um, the historical development, how the Lord prepared us to receive the health message. The health message was not the first thing that God introduced to us. He basically introduced uh, the Sabbath conferences that helped to organize everything together for us. Um, they, they, they helped to uh, organize our doctrines together until we had a firm, firm platform upon which the foundational doctrines of our truth were established. After that was sorted, after we, have, we had our foundation sorted, after our relationship with Christ was clear, our mission was clear, the gospel was clear to our minds, and our hearts were surrendered to God. Then the Lord led the Adventist Church um, um, into what we call the organization of this group of people into an institution, uh, a conference institution. And that is uh, very important. Uh, in 1860, the first step in organization were taken. The organization of the first legally organized church at Pikeville, Michigan on May 30. Um, the Review and Herald on May 29, 1860. And uh, also the name Seventh-day Adventist was chosen that year. And uh, lastly, May 21, 1863 the General Conference of the Seventh-day Adventist Church was organized. So God gave us truth, organized us as his people, gave us a mission to share to the world, and then and only then did he give us the health message. So it's important for us to keep that order in mind, that what needs to be introduced to the world is the gospel, Christ and his righteousness. 
when people are transformed by the righteousness of Christ and they are attracted by his beauty, uh, then it will be wiser for us to introduce the health message afterwards. Um, the health message came after the church was organized. Um, the Lord could now turn his attention more directly and fully to his third priority, the development of the health emphasis. Um, significantly, a mere 16 days after the formal organization of the church, of the General Conference in early June 1863, Ellen White received her first health reform vision. When we talk about Ellen White and health uh, reform visions or the health visions that were the ones that were instrumental in the health message that she gave, we are talking about the Otsego vision, we are talking about the vision that she received in Rochester. But this June 6 one uh, was the Otsego vision where she had a vision for about 45 minutes where a lot of things that ended up com uh, constituting what we call Ellen White's health message was given to her in vision. So that is a very important part of what we are discussing now. Um, having said that, uh, why in Otsego? What was it about the Otsego vision that made it what it is? Um, we are discussing the Otsego vision and uh, what was happening there. Um, on June 6, 1863, Ellen White and uh, James White and about a dozen other people, 12 other people, were in the small town of Otsego, uh, in the northwest uh, part of Battle Creek, 25 miles northwest of Battle Creek. Um, there were at least two reasons why they went there. James White, uh, he had a chronic workaholic problem and he had worked himself out. He was just barely turning 42 years and um, he was left with two months before he could uh, reach his 42, uh, 42nd birthday and uh, he was suffering signs of serious uh, workaholic tendencies, a burnout, uh, largely from constant and excessive labor. Uh, testimonies for the Church, Volume 1, page 517, gives us that. So they thought that uh, possibly um, a weekend out in Otsego would help to refresh them. Uh, so they decided to go there. The other reason was that um, an evangelist by the name of R.J. Lawrence and also M.E. Cornell were conducting an evangelistic camp, tent, camp meeting um, at uh, Otsego. It was an evangelistic kind of uh, reach out outreach program. Three or four age carriage loads of people drove up on Friday as show of moral support. So there were other people that tagged along and they went there. So Friday evening, um, we found ourselves all assembled at the Brother Hillard's family for worship, but a dozen being present. The first chapter was read and Sister White led in prayer. Brother White kneeling across the corner from her. Her bed in prayer was for him. And as she prayed, while still on her knees, she moved over his side, laid her hands on his shoulders, and prayed until she was taken in vision. This lasted for about three quarters of an hour. So this vision lasted for about uh, 45 minutes. It was Friday evening. It was actually June 5. It was the beginning of the Sabbath. But Ellen White documents it to be June 6 as the time that she started writing that. So opening of the Sabbath is about 12 people, and James White is in a very terrible health condition and uh, basically he needs prayer so Ellen White kneels down after the reading of the Bible and prays significantly for them and as he's praying for them at this time she was given light on health reform brother White was already blessed and encouraged and he was relieved of the burden of discouragement that he had been carrying so um, Ellen White is given this vision and she shares this uh, vision um, in a form uh, later on afterwards and uh, the lessons that we learn I'm not going to combine the health message because I don't have time to even go to the Rochester vision that I spoke about and other subsequent vision that she had later on but the main purpose of this study is to show you what visions Ellen White went through and uh, the experiences that she had to go through in order for her to share the health message that she, she, we, have, we have received as Seventh-day Adventists Lessons from the visions. Lesson number one was that the care of health is a religious duty. Up to that time, many people did not really connect health and spirituality. One of the first unique things that Ellen White did was to connect health and spirituality and not only not make it a spiritual issue, but also make it our health duty. 
So she says, and um, spiritual gifts for volume 4A, page 148. She says, I saw that it was a sacred duty to attend to our health and arouse others to their duty. It was a sacred duty for us to be careful of the health that God has given us and to attend to it. The body which God calls his temple should be preserved in as healthy a condition as possible. Many act as though they had a right to treat their own bodies as they please. They do not realize that God claims upon them. They are required to glorify him in their bodies and spirits, which are his. It is a sacred duty which God has enjoyed upon reasonable beings formed in his image to keep that image in a perfect state as possible. Uh, all are required to do what they can to preserve healthy bodies and sound minds. So the first thing that Ellen White emphasized is the lesson on we need to take care of our physical health. We need to take care of our mental health. We need also to take care of our emotional and spiritual health. God is concerned and expects us to take care of our bodies, which was something very, very revolutionary. It has been a biblical teaching, now finding a new emphasis and a context that's setting in the 1860s. The second emphasis of Ellen White's health message was the cause of disease. For the first time, the world heard that the cause of disease is a violation of the health laws. Um, the, many people had attributed disease to have been caused by so many various types of things other than a violation of health laws. Uh, physicians at that time were not comfortable with that kind of thinking that health actually leads to, um, I mean, disease is caused by a violation of health laws. This is what we find in Councils on Health, page 19. She says, disease is an effort of nature to free the system from conditions that result from a violation of the laws of health. In case of sickness, the cause should be ascertained and healthful conditions should be changed, wrong habits corrected. Then nature is to be assisted in her effort to expel impurities and to reestablish right conditions in the system. So the second thing is that the cause of disease is a violation of the health laws. She gave health laws and she said, you are sick because you are violating these eternal principles that God has always given us. And these health laws were, did not originate with Ellen White. They were biblical principles, but they were brought to her in, with such clarity and emphasis and clear application of how um, to apply them in our modern day than uh, it could ever have happened before. The third lesson we are learning from those visions is that she attacked intemperance on many fronts. Um, and she defined true temperance uh, as teaching us to dispense entirely with everything hurtful and to use judiciously that which is healthful. Uh, Partisan Prophets 5, 562. Um, Ellen White, to her, uh, intemperance encompassed quite a lot of things. In the time of Ellen White, there were movements such as the Women Temperance Union Conference, which was geared to sensitizing the nation about the dangers of alcohol use and uh, many other things. But Ellen White touched things that no health reformer ever touched at that particular time on health reform. Uh, the list of intemperance, um, signs of intemperance included five categories in Ellen White's health message. Number one, stimulating drinks. Um, so, as might be expected, alcohol came in for attack as a stimulating drink, an intoxicant that confused the brain and brought men down to the level of the brute creation. Spiritual Gifts, Volume 4, page 125. But perhaps much less expected were her equally strong criticism of tea, coffee, this she declared as stimulating. Their effects are similar to those of tobacco, but their effect uh, but their effect is a, in a less degree. Spiritual Gifts, Volume 4, page 128. So stimulating drinks did not only, according to Ellen White's message, include alcohol. In the list of stimulating drinks, she included tea, she included coffee, and uh, she said this was stimulating. Um, this was very, very revolutionary. Apparently, after she came out of vision, and they asked her, what did you see? She said, I saw strange things. So strange, so strange. She was shocked at this because it was a message coming directly from God. The second thing in the list of things she classified as uh, 
needing to be gotten rid of was tobacco. Um, that was very strange at that time. Tobacco in whatever form is a slow and sure poison. That's what Ellen White said in Spiritual Gifts, Volume 4a, page 126. This also included snuff. Some of the people do not smoke tobacco, but they used snuff. It affects the brain and benumbs the sensibilities so that the mind cannot clearly discern spiritual things. Especially those truths which have a tendency to correct this filthy indulgence. Those who use tobacco in any form are not clear before God. Now, this came at a time when Seventh-day Adventists uh, in America and other parts of the world used to smoke. They used to smoke tobacco. This was so much of a shock. Uh, there was so much debate. Uh, some people trying to uh, defend the tobacco habit that they had. Yes, they kept the Sabbath. Yes, they kept the Ten Commandments. But they also, they also smoked. Uh, and through this message, it was to help them get away from these stimulating drinks, tea, coffee, tobacco, and uh, many other things. The other thing that Ellen White classified as needing uh, us to exercise self-control over was highly spiced foods. Came under the rubric of intemperance, specifically highly seasoned flesh meats, rich gravies, uh, Spiritual Gifts, Volume 4, page 129. Rich cakes, pies, puddings. Uh, Spiritual Gifts, Volume 4, page 130. And various kinds of rich preserves. Such rich foods breaks down the healthy organs of the body and mind. Causes the children in particular to become feeble, pale, and dwarfed. Such spices are to be eschewed because they have a tendency to excite the animal passions. So this highly seasoned meat actually she says it excites the animal passions and uh, it actually causes the children to be dwarf. Very interesting insight. And uh, she also said it breaks down the healthy organs of the body and the mind. A very, very interesting insight at that time that literally shocked them. The rich cakes and pies at that time. Uh, everybody never said anything negative, including the, the health reformers of that time, including medical doctors of that time. Nobody saw anything wrong with that. The other class of intemperance was overwork. Uh, she classified that as part of intemperance. This had a special application, especially to Ellen's husband, Ellen White's husband, James, who was a chronic workaholic, but also singled out in particular were housewives whose slavery to a hot cook stove resulted in the neglect of their children, ill temper, and a beclouding of the reasoning faculties with consequent fading of spirituality. So overwork was classified as intemperance and lastly indulgence of pay base passions. This one is a little shocking also. Not otherwise more specifically identified was an obvious reference to intemperance in sexual relationships. These were reported to have a tendency to benumb the fine sensibilities so that sacred truths have been placed upon the level with common things. So um, she classified this um, lack of self-control with the bedroom issue, sexual relations, um, as a debasing passion, as destroying reasoning faculties. Um, and God is calling men and women to exercise purity of heart, spiritual gifts, volume 4, 1, 20. So Ellen White had a body of temperance, calling for people to exercise temperance in stimulating drinks, in tobacco, in highly spiced fruits, in overwork, and also indulgence of base passions. Vegetarianism was for the first time revealed to Ellen White also as a third di ideal diet. So uh, as an ideal diet. So that's lesson number three, that God's people need to uh, go back to the original diet of Adam and Eve um, before death became a factor in human existence. Now a wholesome diet consisting of fruits, vegetables, plain whole grain bread, was the ideal. Ellen White spoke against the use of fine wheat, which is white flour. She promoted whole grain bread, recognizing that God had permitted clean animals, as later defined by Leviticus 11, to be eaten after the Noachian flood. Animal food was nevertheless not the most healthy article of food for man. So she acknowledged that after the, uh, the flood, God allowed men to partake of meat, but she said, it was not a healthy article of food for man. And uh, she also gave the reason why God gave it to man. It was to shorten the life of the 
post-diluvians, the people who would live after the flood. This is all found in Spiritual Gifts, Volume 4a, page uh, 120 and 121. The fourth lesson was proper dietary habits, now called for the control of appetite. So this one had to deal with uh, uh, that, that you don't need to eat the whole day. Uh, you can eat three or two meals a day. She highly promoted a two-meal day dietary program as highly preferred. And she said that third meal, an evening meal taken at all should be light and should be eaten several hours before bedtime. Uh, so Ellen White ended up practicing these health principles herself. Number six, lesson number six from the visions of the health message of Ellen White. The control of the mind uh, was an essential feature of this vision. She says, very interesting and quite humorous statement, there's a class of invalids who have no real located disease. But as they believe they are dangerously diseased, they are in reality invalids. The mind is diseased and many die who might recover of disease which exists alone in the imagination. There are people who die because uh, of thinking that they are sick until they really get sick and they die. So the diseased imagination. This was the very first time the world heard that. Again, the power of the will is a mighty soother of the nerves and can resist much disease. She spoke about the will um, as having power to help resist a lot of disease, simply by not yielding to ailments and settling down into a state of inactivity. Those who have but little force and natural energy need to constantly guard themselves, lest their minds become diseased, and they give up to suppose disease when none really exists. So here she's speaking about the mindset, the attitude that you have. If you are feeling sick and you feel like I'm not going to yield to this disease, she says that has a power to activate your body so that the body will be able to come out of that powerfully. So she speaks about the power of the will um, in helping people recover from disease. A very interesting insight. Number seven, Ellen White touched on natural remedies in healing. Lesson number seven. Ellen White, of course, attacked the use of drugs at a time as being dangerous mixtures. And uh, you could understand, you know, the next vomica, the strychnine, opium, mercury, colmel, quinine, and many others uh, that were very de deadly. These were poisons that doctors prescribed uh, to be used by people at that time. So Ellen White spoke about those poisonous, powerful drugs that were very dangerous mixtures at that time. Then she penned this. She was shown that nature alone is the effectual restorer. Nature alone possesses curative powers. She basically said nature is able to bring healing to the diseased body. Spiritual gifts, volume 4a, page 130 136. Then the natural remedies focused in this first major health reform vision were pure air, pure water, um, both internal and external needs that people need to bath and also need to drink. Sunshine um, as a very important for health. Physical exercise, uh, especially uh, manual labor as a very important part of that. Adequate rest, at least eight hours of rest. And fasting for brief periods to give the stomach rest. So, and um, the trust in God uh, principle was later added on in 1885. So the eight laws of health uh, that are now famously known in the New START acronym, nutrition, exercise, water, sunshine, temperance, um, and um, the other ones that you are familiar with. So this was also all given at this particular observer vision. And then the other lesson number eight and nine, the subject of personal cleanliness had been raised in the 1854 vision at Brookfield, New York, as noted above. Now it was re-emphasized and broadened to include body, clothing, and living quarters. Um, Spiritual Gifts, Volume 4, A, page 140 and 141. She encouraged people to at least bath. If um, they have not bathed, they at least to bath two, uh, two times in a week. And that they need to wash their clothes, clean their rooms, uh, leave the windows open uh, so that there's fresh air. And it was a time when those concepts were very revolutionary. And we look at them and we laugh now, but if you were to study the medical literature during the time of Ellen White, and the state of hygiene and health, especially 
in Victorian America, you would be shocked at what was happening. God had required the children of Israel to observe habits of strict cleanliness. He was still a God of cleanliness, and personal cleanliness was now placed on the level of purity of heart as an obligation of all professing Christians. Um, uh, so personal cleanliness was part of that vision. It was very comprehensive, as you can see. Environmental factors concerning uh, concerns were also included in that vision. Uh, the council had to deal with removing decaying vegetation around the house and uh, do not have a big trees in close proximity to family dwellings. Um, and also she encourages the houses to be built on higher altitudes uh, so that um, they could, um, wherever possible, house should be built upon high dry ground because low lens locations tended to foster the settling of water, which in turn would produce poisonous miasma. This would be mold and mold and other things that caused fever, ache, sore throat, lung disease, and fever. Uh, so this is a very interesting insight here, spiritual gifts. So you can see that this um, health message was very comprehensive. It had to deal with physical health that dealt with exercise, natural remedies, avoiding taking stimulants, and also eating at certain times. And uh, it also encompassed emotional health and also hygiene. Uh, and also uh, health in terms of where you locate your house, how to keep your house tidy. It was a very comprehensive uh, message. Health education by the church was the last one uh, of this lesson. It was that the church needed to educate people. She says, I saw that it was a sacred duty to attend to our health and arouse others to their duty. We have a duty to speak, to come out against intemperance of every kind. I saw that we should not be silent upon the subject of health, but should make up minds to the subject. Uh, I saw that children should be instructed, and we should take time to teach them, so that this message needs to spread around the world, and people need to be taught. So this is, in summary, um, what I would classify as Ellen White's um, health vision. Um, the, and then the 1865 one, the Rochester one, is the one that was instrumental in calling the church now to build sanitariums, our own sanitariums, which led to a big movement um, and uh, a significant um, emphasis that took place as a result of that. So this was the health message that came to Ellen White, an amazing principles of health that literally revolutionized how Adventists live. Many people started practicing that, including Ellen White herself, and uh, she really, really struggled with meat eating and um, she basically spent almost a week without eating anything because they would serve her vegetables. She really loved meat, but she said, stomach, you have to listen to the mind. And uh, finally, her appetite got used to uh, the other diet, the, 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 the vegetarian diet. Um, so we now want to look at the scientific validation of Ellen White's um, health message. Okay, does it stand scientific scrutiny and scientific um, um, analysis and criticism? Um, is Ellen White, can Ellen White be classified as scientifically accurate in what she did? One of the most prominent and eminent physicians of the time of Ellen White was Dr. Kellogg. He was the director of the Battle Creek Sanitarium, a well-renowned surgeon um, and also a cook. Uh, an inventor, a very knowledgeable man. Peanut butter was invented by him, granola was invented by him, and many other inventions came from the hand of J.H. Kellogg. Uh, and even morning breakfast cereals, the bran flakes, the corn flakes, and all this was the invention of Kellogg. He was a very brilliant man, a leading scientist in his time, um, and uh, also uh, a leading physician. Uh, he earned a lot of uh, accolades as a well-accomplished physician in the time of Ellen White. In 1897, this is what Dr. Kellogg said on March 3rd. This is recorded in the General Conference Bulletin. Every single statement with reference to healthful living and the general principles that underlie the subject have been verified by scientific discovery. There is not a single principle in relation to healthful development of our bodies and minds that is advocated in these writings from Sister White, which I'm not prepared to demonstrate conclusively from scientific evidence. 
um, the writings 30 years ago are fully substantiated by the scientific discoveries of today. Kellogg says Ellen White's writings line up. And one of the reasons why Kellogg was so successful as a physician was to put into practice uh, what Ellen White had written as the principles of health. Well, let me go to another professor, professor of nutrition, Dr. Cleve McKay. Um, he had a more remarkable testimony to share in validating Ellen White's um, um, nutrition statement. Let me just give you a, a brief biography of Dr. Cleve McKay. He spent his 35-year uh, teaching career at Cornell University. He started teaching in 1927 and uh, finished in 1962. He was actually a professor, Professor McKay. He also authored and co-authored more than 150 scientific papers on various aspects of nutrition. One of the areas of expertise was the history of nutrition. Uh, this was one of his areas of expertise, this uh, particular man. Dr. McKay's contribution to that science was so significant that upon his death in 1967, the Journal of the American Dietetic Association published a comprehensive life sketch in the Journal of Nutrition devoted 10 full pages to the retrospective survey of his life work. He was a, a, a leading nutritionist, one of the leading nutritionists in his time. He came across Ellen White um, as writings from a student who was doing his master's in nutrition um, and uh, he was struck by what he heard. Uh, Dr. McKay, after analyzing and reading the book Councils on Diets and Food and uh, other books by Ellen White, um, was so shocked. Let me give you a background to Dr. McKay. Dr. McKay refused to date the beginning of modern nutritional science earlier than 1900s. Uh, she just said uh, there were nonsense, um, mainly an array of nonsense. Yet Dr. McKay, in a three-part series of articles, written for Review and Herald in 1959, said something very interesting about Ellen White. F.D. Nicole, who was the editor of the Review and Herald, uh, met Dr. Cleve McKay and asked him to write uh, an article. Um, and that article appeared in 1959, and we're going to quote from that article, which was published on February 26. Mrs. White's basic concepts about the relation between diet and health have been verified to an unusual degree by scientific advances of the past decade. Um, 100, almost 100 years before, Dr. Kellogg had said Ellen White's uh, um, statements of health have been verified by science. And now in 1959, Dr. McKay says the same thing. Someone may attempt to explain this remarkable effect by saying Mrs. White simply borrowed her ideas from others. But how would she know which ones to ideas to borrow and which ones to reject out of a bewildering array of theories and health teachings current uh, in the 19th century? She would have had to be a most amazing person with knowledge beyond your times in order for her to do this successfully. Dr. McKay concluded authoritatively, in spite of the fact that the works of Mrs. White were written long before the advent of modern scientific nutrition, she says, no better overall guide is available today. 1959, a nutritionist confirming the validity of Ellen White's statement of health. Does modern science corroborate Dr. McKay's findings and his uh, conclusions? Let's continue. There are still more. I mean, the scientific studies validating Ellen White's health message is so much that if I was to try and exhaust each of them, even to our current time, it would take the whole time um, of this study. But I'm just going to share with you some of the uh, amazing ones. I'm just going to choose four that have been validated even by modern science. Science has confirmed virtually all the cancers that emanated from Ellen White's first major vision reform of 1863. Limitations of space, uh, as I said, uh, would not allow us to basically be able to look at this. Between 1950 and 1990, the scientific discoveries that were made confirmed some of these following points about Ellen White's health vision. Tobacco. Remember what we talked about tobacco? 
1863, Ellen White declared that tobacco was a slow, deceitful, or insidious and malignant poison. Those words were heavy. And uh, what does science, does science confirm that? In the early 1950s, a medical doctor by the name of Alton Oshner, a professor of thoracic surgery at Tulane University Medical School, New Orleans, was among the earliest to demonstrate an undeniable link between cigarette smoking and lung cancer. And the three characterization by Ellen White, um, and uh, basically this man said uh, there's a link between um, lung cancer and cigarette smoking. He was the first one to bring that link in the scientific studies. Ellen White said uh, tobacco is a slow, deceitful or insidious and the most malignant poison. Um, is it really slow in the way it kills? Uh, well, we'll ask them. Medical pathologists today declare that it takes approximately 20 years to incubate a full-blown case of lung cancer. It'll take about 20 years. You will die. You will die, but it's a slow killer. The second thing is that it's a deceitful and or insidious. Uh, medical specialists will tell us that if the patients wait for over overt symptoms of lung cancer to appear, it usually is too late to save their lives. Those who smoke and they're just waiting for obvious signs of lung cancer uh, to come, generally, by the time those signs appear, the person dies. So the people who smoke will have to regularly go for routine x-ray checks to verify uh, whether their lungs are in a safe condition and they don't have lung cancer. So in that sense, it's deceitful because the person thinks it's fine until they just fall and die. And the most malignant, the word malign malignant, <coughs> is a term that is generally used in relation to uh, dangerous types of cancer. Uh, no in, uninformed medical scientist today would dispute the demonstrated link between cigarette smoking and lung cancer. So Ellen White's statement in 1863 has now been confirmed uh, by science later on, almost 100 years later. How about the statements she made about coffee? Ellen White was told by an angel from heaven in the autumn of 1848 and again in the spring of 1863 that the drinking of coffee was deleterious to health and even life-threatening. In March 12, 1981, New England Journal Medicine veteran epidemiologist Dr. Brian McMahon reported on a study done by his team of Harvard University School of Public Health researchers. Uh, according to their study, the predisposing cause of cancer of the pancreas, one of the fastest killers of cancers today, is coffee drinking. So this uh, Dr. Brian McMahon, McMahon at Harvard University School of Public Health, they found that uh, coffee is one of the leading um, causes of um, pancreatic cancer. Um, so that's, that's very interesting. He was also, um, this was also confirmed by Mevin G. Haddaj. Uh, Haddaj is a, a, a doctor in uh, public health and also a physician. Uh, he was actually at this time a health and temperance department uh, leader at the general conference. Said this something very, very interesting. Uh, he says, I think caffeine is addictive. I'm a pharmacologist, increases uh, the incidence of coronary heart disease is an adjunct to hypertension and consequential stroke, is a real instigator of peptic and duodenal ulcers, produces birth defects, has long been known to affect chromosomes, and in recent reports coming from the Adventist Health Study, is related to a significant increase in cancer. So this man says uh, caffeine, which you generally find in coffee, uh, is responsible for peptic and duodenal ulcers, produces birth defects and uh, leads to hypertension, which finally leads to stroke, um, increases the risk of coronary heart disease. And uh, it's, 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 it's just mind boggling that even children's birth defects could come from that. That's why Ellen White said we should stay away from it. But what is so sad, even though science has confirmed it, the Lord has told us 
We still love our coffee. We still want to drink our coffee. Um, and then the other thing that has been significantly validated by science, even to our time, is Ellen White's Council on Vegetarianism. Ellen White's first Ellen White first learned of the substantial health hazards of a non-vegetarian diet in 1863. She herself became a vegetarian immediately a day after. Councils on Diets and Food, page 40 to 44, um, narrates that for us. Animals are becoming more and more diseased, she said, and it will not be long until animal food will be discarded by many besides Seventh-day Adventists. This was penned way back. Uh, in 1863. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 7, page 124. This statement is true. Many non seventh day Adventists are advocating a vegetarian diet, and they're even going to a vegan diet now in America. The world is going vegan. Perhaps the most recent distinguished non Adventist scientist to become forward in vegetarianism is uh, Dr. Dean Onish. His professional pedigree is impressive. Let's look at his professional pedigree. He was an assistant clinical professor of medicine, University of California, San Francisco School of Medicine, attending physician at Pacific Presbyterian Medical Center, San Francisco, and president and director of Preventive Medicine Research Institute, Sausalito, California. So he was a well-accomplished physician and a doctor. His recent findings were a little short of startling, writing in the hospital practice of May 15, 1991. Uh, the, uh, the title of his article was, Can Lifestyle Change Reverse Coronary Atherosclerosis? Onish reported that by combining strict, low-fat vegetarian diet, moderate aerobic exercise, abstinence from smoking, and a stress management training, his study group was able to show Measurable regression of the disease in patients with severe coronary atherosclerosis. So, with exercise, uh, low fat diet, vegetarian diet, abstinence from smoking, stress management, um, he was able to show that you could actually help parent, I mean, people significantly um, experience regression of uh, coronary atherosclerosis. Very interesting insights. Then other scientists and doctors challenged Dr. Onish. And when they challenged him, he brought forth a lot of evidence. Um, even severely blocked arteries began to unclog in the majority of heart patients when they stopped eating animal products and made their simple lifestyle changes. Atherosclerosis can be reversed, argued Dr. Onish. On a December 13, 1990 study in New England Journal of Medicine provides persuasive new evidence that the more red meat and animal fat women ate, the more likely they were to get colon cancer. Um, the optimum amount of red meat you should eat should be zero. This was Dr. Walter Willett, the chief director of the study. He said, if you want to eat the optimum amount of red meat for you to stay healthy, you should eat none. This was way back in 1990. Dr. T. Colin Campbell of Cornell University directed a landmark study of 6,500 persons in the mid-90s. It's famously known as the China study. He found that the more meat they ate, the more likely they were to die prematurely from coronary heart disease, colon cancer, breast cancer, prostate cancer, lung cancer, among others. So you can see that when Ellen White is calling us to leave meat alone, it's not just saying things, it's God's wisdom in calling us into a vegetarian lifestyle so that we can avoid becoming victims of these various types of cancers. Just from meat, colon cancer, breast cancer, prostate cancer, lung cancer, among many other cancers. Many athletes are foregoing the pre-game steak for foods high in complex carbohydrates because they find that eating less, less meat often increases their endurance. Most beef is still very high in fat and cholesterol. Studies also indicate that meat protein and perhaps other substances in the beef raise the risk of cancer and other heart diseases. In conclusion, Dr. Onish played on a recent slogan 
of the American Beef Association. The slogan said, Beef, real food for real people. And Dr. Onish coined that and said, Meat, real food for real death. This was way back in the 90s. In our time, just recently, the World Health Organization um, issued a statement. There's now this, there is now a clear body of evidence that bowel cancer is more common among, common among those who eat the most red and processed meat. Processed meat consumption has been strongly linked to a higher risk of stomach cancer. Even the World Health Organization is confirming uh, Ellen White's statements uh, on this, uh, promoting a vegetarian lifestyle. The World Health Organization has classified processed meats, including ham, sal salami, bacon, frankfurts, as group 1 carcinogen, which means there is strong evidence that processed meats cause cancer. Red meat such as beef, lamb, pork, has been classified as probable cause of cancer. It still causes cancer. This classification do not indicate the risk of getting cancer, rather how certain are we that these things are likely to cause cancer. This was a cancer council that was published in Australia. So the World Health Organization confirms um, the evidence that we find in Ellen White's writings. When we started, we said, believe in the Lord, your God, so shall you be established. Believe in his prophet, so shall you prosper. I'm appealing to you to listen to the prophet of the Lord so that you will not be able to suffer the consequences. If Seventh-day Adventists that heeded this concept, recently you are hearing that coronavirus is very, very deep, deadly when it meets people with serious chronic lifestyle diseases, especially uh, cancers and diabetes and many of these lifestyle diseases that are reversible and preventable if only we could listen to the Ellen White's health message. I pray and hope you have been blessed. This Councils of Ellen White on Health, you can find them in the book Councils on Diets and Food that was written to be an encyclopedia. Uh, it's very, very powerful compilation that can help you uh, understand that better. You can find this Councils, Councils on Health and Foods, based on Diet and Food, basically helps you with physical health, what to eat, how to prepare it, and things like that. Then you also have emotional health and mental health. This you will find in Mind, Character and Personality, Volume 1 and 2. You also have councils that have to deal with the principles of health. You will find this in Ministry of Healing and uh, councils on health. You know, councils um, on health and hygiene. And there are many, many other books that have been written by Ellen White on this. Like Dr. Cliff McKell, uh, McKay said, there is no better overall guide in health. There are many things that science still has yet to confirm that Ellen White has written. And I believe that science has a long way to catch up to Ellen White. Because this was not Ellen White, this was God who created you and wants you to live healthy. Thank you so much for listening. Let us close our eyes for prayer. Father, we thank you for the wonderful message you have given us through the pen of inspiration. Um, and we ask for you to help us to put into practice the lessons of health that you have given us. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Thank you for watching.